welcome you to the program tonight. So um, this topic is called Put Your Back Into It, Common Injuries of the Low Back. Uh, this is part of our Dance Injury Prevention webinar series. So it's the last in the series. We're very excited to close it out in a good way. Um, and on tonight's webinar, our speakers are gonna discuss the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of painful strains, sprains, and stress, fra stress fractures of the low back. Um, so our speakers today are HSS physiatrist, Dr. Ellen Casey, and HSS physical therapist, Jason Mayerhofer. So we're so glad to have you guys here tonight. Um, I'm gonna close out this poll here. So I see we've got some people from New York and from other states as well. Um, and we've got a few dance instructors, a few physical therapists and some other folks joining us tonight. All right. So let's get started. Um, to start off, can we discuss, you know, how big of a problem is low back pain in dancers and how prevalent is it um, is there, you know, more pain per genre of dance or more risk of injury, uh, depending on the genre? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's definitely a, a hot topic with, I think, just how prevalent low back pain is in the global community. It doesn't even need to be dance. It's just, uh, it's, it's the biggest leading uh, case of disability throughout the globe. Uh, so I think that that is something to factor in. Um, there's been a lot of research on this, um, to really quickly summarize it. A lot of it's kind of inconclusive. Uh, there's a lot of variability, uh, when it comes to the prevalence of it. Um, it ranges from some of the numbers I saw were 5% to 88%. I mean, it's such a huge range to really nail down. Um, the prevalence of it is a little bit challenging. Uh, some of the reasons behind that is dancers are a, just phenomenal athletes. And a lot of the times they can perform through pain. Um, I helped cover uh, a dance school up in Massachusetts and, uh, over the summer. And a lot of the times they grind out six, seven, eight shows in a weekend. And it doesn't really matter if they're hurting, they're going to do it anyway. So uh, the likelihood that they might not actually report having back pain is, is highly um, prevalent. And the other piece too, is that um, often they'll experience injuries that are at concomitant joints and might not include the low back or a risk of low back injury kind of, and, and you know, when they're looking at this in statistics, they don't really factor that in as being a contributing factor to the quote unquote low back injury uh, stat. Um, usually the yearly prevalence is around 73% that we do see um, people reporting back pain uh, with a lifetime potential prevalence of the dance community at around 50%. So at some point they might experience it. Uh, it might be mild in severity. And again, the systematic review that I was looking at in research from 2020 um, and looking at that in, that in that lifetime prevalence, it might be mild. And the scales that they were using and rating things by were highly variable, mild to one to three days, and then a different study might look at mild as seven to 10 days. So again, there's so much variability out in, in the uh, research that it's really hard to really nail it down. Um, and then to address the other point is uh, a lot of the research tends to be with ballet. Um, there's more coming up for modern dance, hip hop, things like that. Uh, the highest prevalence seems to be with ballet, but there is some uh, evidence starting to emerge more with modern dance, not so much with hip hop, but again, I think as that form of dance becomes a little bit more popular in the research realm, you'll start to see some more statistics. I just think that there's, there's inconclusive evidence at, at present time uh, in looking at that. I think Jason really did a great job of summarizing kind of the challenges of getting our arms around how big of a problem this is, because, you know, for the reasons he said, it's hard to know the exact prevalence, but we know for sure that it is common um, for dancers to develop low back pain. And one of the other challenges is that it's not 
often, um, I mean, sometimes back pain occurs acutely, like, boom, I did this particular move or I landed a jump and I had back pain and now, you know, I'm dealing with that. But oftentimes as, as the folks on this, you know, call know, it's gradual onset. It's a little bothersome. You work through it. It kind of goes away. Then it comes back. Choreography changes. It gets a little bit more painful. And so really saying like, hey, this is when this injury started and this is when it ends is very difficult in um, a performing art like dance because, you know, we'll talk about this more. I mean, the training is year round. It starts at an early age and dancers for, you know, it's good and bad. They're used to continuing through pain. So it's hard to even get a, a sense of the prevalence. But also when we think about in sport and exercise medicine, we think about time loss, you know, how much of time are dancers losing in their training or performances? It's hard to know that because these aren't distinct injuries usually. Um, but, you know, it is a major cause of time loss and even retirement. So, you know, we certainly know um, of dancers that, you know, will not be able to train at all or are training at a reduced capacity due to, um, you know, their back pain, or maybe they can't do specific shows or a certain type of choreography because of that injury. Um, trying to get a handle of how many dancers retire because of back pain is also difficult. I did see a study out of the UK that looked at British ballet dancers and of it was all retired ballet dancers. And they asked, you know, who retired because of pain or injury and about 25%. So they retired because of back pain or lower limb pain. Um, you know, so it's hard to differentiate those two, but, um, you know, it definitely is an issue that can Re, uh, reduce participation, reduce livelihood if you're a professional dancer, or reduce opportunities to audition if you're trying to break into that area, um, and, and shorten careers. And so I think that's why you can see it's physical therapists and, and dance instructors so far on the call, or at least when we did the poll, and we know it, we all know it's a big problem, and that's why we're talking about it tonight. And I think uh, just one other thing to add, just some of the risk factors that much of the research tends to look at is, and with uh, as with any injury, is a prior incidence of injury. So if a dancer has prior uh, previously injured their back, the likelihood of them injuring their back again and again is pretty high, um, as well as the increase in age. And, and to Dr. Casey's point, um, when they start to get a little bit older, things get a little bit more rigid when, when it comes to movements, uh, they start to tend to see um, potential increase in low back as well as the uh, the dance level and, and the uh, demands that are put on on the dancer as well. So again, conflicting evidence as to the statistical significance of those actually causing it. Again, with what Dr. Casey was saying, it's really hard to pinpoint is that the actual cause or not. But again, these are all factors that are being looked at and, and something that we're all aware of and keep in mind as, as we uh, approach you know, uh, treating these patients. All right. Yeah, this is a great start. And I can, you know, I'm imagining their frustration with this, um, with this condition. And it's a long building issue. And I can see, you know, why they would want to push through it. Um, so moving forward, do we know why low back pain is so common in dancers? And, you know, what's the reasoning behind it? Does it have to do with our anatomy and how we use our bodies when we do certain kinds of dance? Yeah, so that's a great question. And, and, you know, we don't know all of the reasons that injuries occur, of course, but um, if you can share the slides, we'll pull up a couple pictures of anatomy. And again, for the physical therapists on the uh, call here, bear with us, because certainly this is um, you know, basic for, for you all, uh, probably for the instructors as well. But as many of you know, um, the spine is composed of multiple different structures, but the main kind of uh, building uh, blocks are these blocks of bone called vertebral bodies, and then they have discs in between them. The spinal cord runs through the central canal, and then nerves at each level exit into the upper limbs or the legs, depending on the, the place in, in the spine. And so you can see, if you look at this color coded, we have um, a yellow color for the cervical vertebrae, which is also corresponds to the neck, green for the thoracic vertebrae, which is the mid-back, 
pink for the lumbar vertebrae, and then the sacrum and coccyx are blue. And you can appreciate that there are these reciprocal curves throughout the spine when we look at it from a side view or a sagittal view. And what we're seeing is that the cervical and the lumbar vertebrae curve this way, and we call that lordosis. And then the thoracic vertebrae curves this way, as well as the sacrum and coccyx, and that is called kyphosis. And certainly people have variations within the norm of this. So you know, a lot of us, because we're on our devices and um, computers, our head is forward and maybe kind of accentuates that um, cervical lordosis. Um, some people might have a more pronounced thoracic kyphosis or rounded mid-back. If people have abnormal curvature in the coronal plane, like scoliosis, that might affect this as well. Um, but if we today we're talking about low back pain and dancers, so we're talking about that pink section there. And then there are two other pictures sort of next to it, just the skeleton and then uh, dancer with more of the kind of soft tissue overlaying the core and the in the lumbar spine doing an arabesque. And you can appreciate that in especially the skeleton picture doing the arabesque. If you follow that spinal curvature, where most of that extension uh, motion is coming from is from the lumbar spine. And so, um, you know, the demands of this very large range of motion that's required in dance, particularly ballet, but certainly all sorts of genres, is that, you know, one of the amazing things that dancers do is they move from these extreme ranges of motion, often quickly and repetitively. And so um, sometimes what can be a source of leading to injury is one might be, you know, just the repetitive nature of going to those end ranges of motion and the amount of volume and duration and intensity that dancers do year after year after year. Also, um, oftentimes um, in, in activities like dance or gymnastics or figure skating, the priority is on that range of motion rather than the stability, right? So you have, ideally you're able to do both. You get a big range of motion, but you're controlling that dynamically with the musculature rather just sort of letting the passive structures, which in this case include, you know, the ligaments and the bones of the spine to absorb that force. So the demands of dance overlaid on the anatomy of the spine are oftentimes lead to the types of injuries that we see in dancers. And then if we go to the next slide, we're going to zoom in a little bit further. Um, so this is basically looking at a smaller section within the lumbar spine. So as I mentioned, the way that the, the stacking of the bones works is it goes bone, which is vertebrae, then disc, and then another vertebrae. And um, if you can actually hit next slide, it'll add some animation there. Um, you know, so we like to think of the structures very basically as in the front of the spine and in the back. And so the structures in the front of the spine are the vertebral bodies or the big bulk of bone and the discs. There are other structures too, but we're going to boil it down a little bit. So those structures in the front of the spine tend to get injured with more of the flexion, folding forward, tucking, bending, you know, rolling, and sometimes landing depending the position that the spine would be in. And so when people are coming in and telling us I have pain with dance and we're asking questions about, well, what movements hurt and trying to figure out why, we're trying to put them in categories basically of people that hurt with certain types of movements. So if somebody hurts with folding forward and flexing, we're thinking maybe about the vertebral bodies or the discs, maybe some muscles as well. The elements in the back of the spine are the elements that tend to absorb and have to withstand the forces with a lot of extension or arching or that arabesque that I talked about. And so you can see that in blue, what, what the squares in blue are surrounding the facet joints, which um, you have basically um, contributions to two facet joints above and below the vertebrae. And then the red square, which we see it in two different views, is basically um, focusing on a portion of the bone that's known as the pars interarticularis. And it's not necessary that you remember that specific part, we'll circle back to it later, but that piece of bone tends to have to withstand a lot of those arching forces as well. And so when we talk about specific injuries in a few minutes, it'll at least be helpful that we reviewed some of the specific anatomy to kind of go through that. All right, great. Um, and Jason, can you discuss a little bit of 
the demands that are on the lumbar spine and dancers, how are they, you know, using it and putting a lot of pressure on that area? Absolutely. And, you know, Dr. Casey, thank you for, for giving us the, the Cliff's Notes version of the of spinal anatomy. Um, I think she really highlights all the, the important components of it. And the first thing that I could definitely um, uh, agree with, uh, with her on that is just the uh, extreme ranges of motion that need to occur with, with any form of dance. Um, and the, basically the reliance on those passive restraints, the, the ligaments, the bones, rather than the dynamic stabilizers, the muscles. Uh, the muscle can only work in its, in its capacity. And at some point it does have a fail point as does bone, as do ligaments. And when you encounter those, that's when injury does occur. Um, I think the other thing to keep in mind is, is the low back pain really the primary injury or is it a secondary injury? Is there something else going on that maybe uh, is taking away from the stability of a joint? Let's take the hip joint. Is the hip joint fun functioning optimally or is there some form of restriction? Is there some underlying cause of a pathology going on there that is now requiring the spine to move a little bit more? So this is something that um, Dr. Casey and myself like to look at and really figure out essentially what came first, the chicken or the egg? Is it really the spine that came first or is it the hip? And sometimes, uh, in, you know, in this example, treating the hip might solve the problem of the back, but sometimes people can get a little stuck on treating just the back and miss the hip. And that's where recurring injuries tend to occur. So I think that's one piece to it. Um, and something that I like to refer to along with the extreme ranges of motion is something called the anti-anatomic position. This is just not normal for the body to move these certain ways as graceful as it is to watch them perform doing some of these positions. Is, it's a lot of strain on the musculoskeletal system. Um, and sometimes the lack of sufficient rest, there's a high demand for them to constantly perform rehearsal after rehearsal after rehearsal, especially during show times. Uh, and, and the lack of rest is something that I think it is definitely becoming a little bit more prevalent. Um, as well as really exceeding the limits of what the, the dancer's physical capabilities are. Um, you know, you need to definitely factor in some of those things uh, when it comes to dealing with some of these types of injuries. Um, I think also depending on, uh, as Dr. Casey mentioned earlier, early specialization. Um, one of the things that we're really starting to see across all athletics, sports, dance, performing arts, doesn't matter, is the specialization early on. I mean, I can speak when I was younger, I was doing a ton of sport, baseball, basketball, soccer, karate. There's a lot of cross training essentially that's occurring. That unfortunately is going away and, and, and people are starting and athletes are starting things uh, earlier on and sticking with that instead of adding that variety. And so I think the lack of cross training is something that is, I, I like to pride myself in, in caring for my dancers and yes, I do incorporate certain dance movements, but I also get back to the fundamentals and I also encourage them to do things that they are not normally doing because this, this is just the body's way of resetting itself. Um, I know that there's usually a fear of the aesthetics. Um, I know, especially uh, with women, there tends to be a fear of getting too bulky and things like that. It will not happen. I guarantee it will not happen, but to do strength training is vital to include um, when it comes to maintaining basically a homeostasis of your body. Um, one study that um, I did find looking at uh, full-time ballerinas, they actually did a 12-week quadricep and hamstring, so the, the muscles of the thigh, front and back. Uh, they did a 12-week strengthening program, um, and not only did they demonstrate an increase in their strength, uh, but they actually did increase their dance abilities uh, and there were no alterations aesthetically at all uh, that were noted. They measured girth measurements. There was no change whatsoever, but they had reduced their, their risk of injury um, and improved their ability to perform uh, effectively, basically. So I think that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, and then the last thing just uh, that was rummaging through my head is, is society. Our society tends to be, as Dr. Casey was saying, we tend to be on devices. We're sitting a lot more as humans. Um, and back in the 90s, let's say, uh, the population that was considered obese was rather low, 10%, 11%. That has actually climbed to, in 2019, it was up to almost 
Um, so that's a staggering number of, of, of increase in incidents with, with obesity. But as in accordance to that, the World Health Organization actually rates that more than 80% of the 80% of the world's population, um, adolescent population, excuse me, is not active. So basically less than 20% of youngsters who wish really to pursue a dance career have actually been exposed to the, the physical demands and the physical activities at a sufficient level in order to perform things. So just to put that into perspective, that's a big number that really shows how, how people are not prepared a lot of the times to do the activities that um, many dance instructors may require, the physical demands of the, of the performance itself. So I think that is something that is really critical to keep in mind and making sure that there is cross-training occurring, that there is uh, a multifaceted approach to that adolescent's growth. Uh, and there, the specialization tends to wait a little bit later. Can we also talk about um, what are the most common causes of low back pain in dancers and you know what is what's causing this issue? Sure. So, you know, this is going to vary with the type of dancer, the age of the dancer, you know, obviously what they're, what's hurting them. But if you take all dancers combined, especially the younger, you know, youth and adolescent dancer, the, the dancer in that category that has back pain, that is limiting their participation, lasting more than a couple days to a couple weeks, until you prove otherwise, that is a stress fracture in their back um, because that is the most common source of back pain, at least that makes it to my office for sure. Because, you know, muscle strains, of, you know, of course are, are common. Um, I don't usually see those because they get better, they modify and, you know, kind of people go on their way. Um, but if you're coming to see Jason or I, um, you know, for your back pain, our first job is to determine if you have a stress fracture and that's in certainly the youth and then the adolescent um, dancer. And I, as I talked about when we were looking at the anatomy, we think the reason for that is repetitive extension or going from flexion to extension um, over and over during training. And as, as Jason said, you know, every tissue in the body has a fatigue and a breaking point. And we don't know what that's going to be for any given person, but usually a stress fracture in the back starts with um, some type of change in training. They may have had a little hiatus because they had another injury and they returned to dance and all of a sudden their back started to hurt or they changed their choreography or they elevated to a new level. Something about that training often changes and that drives um, a change in the demand to that tissue, in this case, bone. So, you know, they'll start to kind of rub their back. It hurts when I extend. It feels better when I move forward. They want to kind of roll around in a tuck position and the pain can then get more and more severe. So usually if it's a bone issue, it's going to get worse, worse, worse. So um, stress fractures, um, it's important one to identify them because it's a common source of pain. And if we catch it early, we can do something about it, let it heal, and it does not become a chronic issue in most cases. So um, that type of pain in a youth and an adolescent dancer with extension for sure needs to be evaluated. Um, the testing that we typically do is x-rays and often an MRI, um, but sometimes there's other testing that we might include as well to really be very clear about if there's a stress fracture, where it is, how new or old is it, because all of that information tells us how likely it is to heal and how we need to treat it. Now, dancers do not like this injury. They don't like any injury, of course, but I see a lot of gymnasts and dancers, and this breaks my heart when people come in with this injury because it does mean, for the most part, that there is going to need to be a stop in dancing for around 12 weeks, so three months. It's not always the case, but that's kind of a ballpark to start with. Um, and we know that based on years and years of research to allow for healing. So it doesn't mean that the dancer can't participate in anything at all. Um, we recommend mental you know, visualization of dancing. We recommend activity modification. So they'll be in physical therapy. They can do some decent amount of cardio that's not hurting. They can't do anything that's painful, but there's they can be in the pool. There's a variety of things that we can do in that time, but they cannot do any painful activity. And that's for the 12 weeks. Sometimes if they are having pain, even with rest, we might do some 
some bracing or if there's something about their fracture that would require bracing, we might do that. Oftentimes, of course, we're doing physical therapy. And it's not just that um, you need the therapy for the fracture to heal. But as Jason said, well, why did the fracture occur in the first place? Are they really tight in their upper and you know, upper part of their spine or their hips, that's then demanding them to get all their motion from that lumbar spine. You know, what's driving that? We take the time to think about their nutrition and fueling and vitamin D and do they have the nutrients on board to heal that stress fracture? Um, and so it's it's um, an injury in which it has a very, very high potential of healing if we catch it early. Unfortunately, a lot of times we do catch it later because like I said, if you have a little back pain, it gets better, it kind of up and down, and then finally you get assessed. A lot of times it's in more of like that chronic stage in which it doesn't always heal, but there are ways to treat it and get people back to dance. So um, it's it's not something that would keep someone out of dancing for a career for the most part, but it is an injury that we want to identify early. If they have pain with arching back and they're not a youth or adolescent athlete, or, you know, they don't have that stress fracture, then we think about those other structures in the back of the spine, the facet joints, the spinous processes, which are the bones that you can push on on your back. Sometimes dancers doing such extreme range of motion, those bones kind of bump into each other and start to hurt that way. Um, so those are some of the structures in the back of the spine with extension that can hurt. Now, I mentioned before, we always ask about, does it hurt with flexion? And if that's the case, then we're thinking of maybe a muscle strain. Although again, they don't usually come to me because they've already gotten better. Um, we think about disc issues. So discs can hurt when they look normal, but they can also hurt when they start to flatten. If there's little tears in them, if the jelly in the, you know, in the inside of the disc leaks out um, or a herniation, you can have pain in the back or even start to bother the nerves. Um, and then also in the youth um, dancer, they might have, there's some growth centers right in that vertebrae in the bone, and those can stress fracture as well, but that would be more pain with the bending forward, not the arching. Um, and so, you know, um, if people on the call have questions about specific injuries, we can kind of get even more into those, but we're thinking about, does it hurt with flexion or extension, and then sorting out which of these most common entities it likely is. All right. And as you mentioned, just want to, as we're partway through, plug the Q&A. If you guys think of any questions, put them in there. Um, next, can we talk about uh, what, you know, what is the signs that dancers should look out for? When do I, how do I know I should be seen by a doctor? When should I go in for a visit? Yeah, I think um, that's something that is, is always the case. Um, People tend to, it depends on the personality. Some people instantly hurt and they have to get in that day or, or the next day. Others try to ride it out and, and, and let it resolve. Um, a lot of the times back pain just resolves on its own. Um, usually uh, that's one thing that I think you just need to keep in mind is it could just be a little bit of a strain, you know, doing some foam rolling, doing some self-management, things like that will actually relieve itself might have a couple of days of soreness, stiffness, and then the third day, fourth day, you feel fine. So a lot of the times you, you tend to kind of wait it out and see kind of how things progress. Um, I think the essential ones that um, people tend to definitely seek medical care for, whether it be me via uh, what's called direct access, where they can see a physical therapist prior to a physician. Um, and some of the things that we are trained to look out for and make the appropriate referral to someone like Dr. Casey, if we notice certain things, would be any worsening of pain. So if the, if the initial onset occurred and maybe you tried to ride it out for three, four, five days and pain is just getting worse, that is something that is something, you know, that we want a, a physician to take a look at. Um, but I think some of the other more, a little bit more drastic things to keep in mind or any changes in your um, uh, bowel or bladder functioning, whether that be you're retaining and you can't actually avoid, or you have no control and it just happens. Those are things you definitely want to get looked at immediately. Um, loss of function in one or both legs. If you start to notice um, either your foot's dragging or your knees buckling when it normally doesn't, things like that you want to just keep in mind because there could be some impact to the nerves that are feeding the, the muscles of the leg. Uh, and that's something we definitely want you to get looked at. Um, the little bit of the more less common things or any unexplained weight loss or weight gain, 
um, that is uh, just occurring. Uh, it could be 10 pounds gain in a week, you know, something like that. That's a little bit abnormal. You want to keep an eye out for that, as well as any unrelenting night pain. And this is pain. A lot of a lot of the times people get confused with this question. Um, yes, pain will occur at night if you're being sedentary. Usually, though, my follow-up question would be, can you move and roll over or change positions? And it subsides a little bit and you're okay and you fall back to sleep. The unrelenting pain is the pain just climbs to about a 10 out of 10 and you cannot relieve it. It's just getting worse and worse. That is something to be a little bit more cautious about. So I would say those are the extremes of things that, that you would seek out myself or Dr. Casey for um, when it comes to uh, medical attention. And Dr. Casey, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. I think that's perfect. I mean, it, for the most part, um, you know, I very much think, you know, direct access makes a ton of sense, you know, for back pain, like absolutely see Jason. And, you know, if, if we were, you know, together talking to some dancer that had back pain, I'd say see Jason first, because one, um, as you'll see, as we talk about treatments, like that's always going to be, I, I don't know that I've ever seen a dancer with back pain and their physical therapy hasn't been included. That's always going to be part of the treatment plan. And um, oftentimes like there, if, you know, once you work with um, you know, physical therapists and Enough and they, you know, working with me, I mean, Jason would just say, listen, I think this is a stress fracture. This is what I'm noticing. And then absolutely, we're getting the imaging. We're making that happen. It's a real team approach. It should be between a physical therapist and a physician, but also, you know, um, you might be seeing a Pilates instructor or an acupuncturist or a chiropractor. And hopefully those people are looking for these signs too, that Jason outlined, because those are the things where we need to address it early. And it's tough. And, you know, dancers are going to have a pain a lot of the time, right? So you don't run to a, a medical provider every time, but, you know, not improving with your stuff that you do normally, getting worse, and all those very worrisome things that Jason mentioned, it's better to get it a ch checked out sooner so that a small thing can be addressed and then not turn into a larger thing that's chronic that needs more intensive care. It's great to know, you know, what things to watch out for and when we need to uh, schedule an appointment. Um, so can we go into some of those? What are the treatments available and what treatments you typically offer when someone comes in with low back pain? Yeah. So spoiler alert, like I said, I is going to send you to physical therapy in almost all cases. I mean, there may be some work up initially to pinpoint, you know, what we think is going on, but um, that is going to be the key and staple part of the management program. There, the part that, of course, you know, I think dancers and athletes don't like, and, you know, I, I get that having been in their shoes before, is that you're going to have to modify the activity in some way. It's rare that we just say, you know, have at it, keep doing what you're doing because you're having pain enough to come in and see us. And it, we try to not have it be complete shutdown. That's never the goal unless it's medically necessary. But we're going to talk about ways to reduce intensity, ways to reduce volume, duration, just taking X, you know, motion out of your repertoire or changing the choreography or maybe not that role this year in Nutcracker, but this role because you're doing, you know, part of a recovery program. So the, the conversation should be as specific as possible about ways to modify dance and cross training, getting into physical therapy and partnering with somebody who's an expert in working with dancers. Of course, there are things like medications to treat pain, sometimes injections, there's surgery, but the, the vast majority of dancers with back pain don't need those things. They need to modify their activity and get excellent rehabilitative exercises. And we're going to talk more about some of those. Yeah. So Jason, I know you have slightly different treatment plans. So can we get into some of those? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think uh, to preface that and um, Bonnie, if you want to bring up uh, some of the slides, we can go right into that. Um, a lot of the times with backs, the initial reaction is to stop and not move um, when it's not stress fracture related. Um, a lot of the, the new approaches to the back and chronic pain and things like that are to move. It's not to be sedentary. So um, I think it depends on what you are experiencing. Um, I usually try to encourage people to move, but in a controlled fashion. Uh, I, I don't recommend just lying in bed and, and sitting with your legs up and not really moving at all. The body's meant to move. 
Uh, pain is a good thing. Pain is a very good thing. It's your alarm system. It prevents you uh, typically from going too far into tissue damage. Um, one thing that I tend to tell uh, some, some people that uh, basically lose function is if you didn't experience any, any pain, um, and you know, I'm just going to use an example here with basketball players, a lot of the times you'll see them jump and they come down and they have torn their Achilles or ruptured their Achilles. They don't have any pain. They just can't function. They can't use it anymore. They've actually broken that barrier. So pain is a good thing. It's your alarm system. It's your protectometer, basically, and it prevents you from going too far into things. Um, so now, in looking at some of these slides, these are just some cross-training um, strategies that I will use with uh, my dancers. I find doing some higher level things challenges them quite a bit um, and really having them go through both, like I uh, mentioned earlier, dance specific movements and non-specific dance movements, I think is beneficial. The body is meant to move anatomically in certain positions. And then uh, when they're dancing, there's a whole uh, separate set of requirements. But again, there's still daily functioning occurring. There's still squats that are occurring in and out of a car, in and out of a chair, on and off a toilet, things like that, where they're not doing certain dance moves to get on and off a toilet. They're doing a normal squat and anatomical movement. So these are, uh, this is just a progression for strengthening some of the muscles that are lining the outside of the hip. Uh, the top left are fire hydrants. Um, the standing clamshell uh, or stand, standing fire hydrant is on the upper right. Uh, and then I really love a side plank with a clamshell. Um, a lot of these really challenge and they'll get, you'll get a nice burn on the outside of your hip when it comes to um, working with this. Uh, I consider the hip abductor group or the, hip, the lateral hip um, muscles as part of your core. It feeds into your pelvis and it helps insert into, into stabilize your spine. So having strong hips is critical when it comes to, uh, to low back pain. I tend to find there is a significant weakness present there. Avani, you can go to the next slide. Um, this is something that I actually found that I, I really liked that was out of a uh, uh, injury prevention program article that was done in 2020. And it basically, it's, it's just a simple star drill. I'm not gonna read the whole paragraph and, and talk about everything, uh, but it's basically encouraging a dancer to, and this is more the dance specific activities, to kind of set up a, a visual star, you can set up cones, and then you'll actually go from point one, two, three, four, and five, and do a lot of these different movements that are, are, that are occurring. Um, good technique is obviously always critical to this. Um, as was with the prior slide, uh, cueing is, is critical in my opinion, and core being engaged and active to do a lot of these exercises to prevent some um, extraneous movements is also encouraged as well. Next slide. Um, these are a little bit more core specific. Uh, the bird dog I find is extraordinarily beneficial uh, for dancers to perform. Uh, this is all posterior chain involvement uh, to keep uh, the spine muscles strong, the hip muscles strong. You involve the shoulders, the lats. It's, it's really a nice comprehensive exercise. You can add resistance bands to these. Uh, same thing all the way to the right with what's called the dead bug or dying bug uh, with opposite arm uh, and leg movements. Um, I like to add a, a big physio ball sometimes in between where they have to add some counter pressure in with that as well. Um, and then some of the other plank variations, I, I'm kind of getting away from a static plank and just holding something for 30 seconds. Again, the body's meant to move and I encourage movement. So adding in a high, uh, a high hold plank with alternating leg extensions or upper extremity twisting with things. Uh, I think this is something that also helps really increase the dynamic stability of the muscles that are lining the spine as well. Next slide, Bonnie. Um, this is a nice, uh, basically just lower extremity progression where you can build in a uh, kind of a single leg squat or, or dynamic squat variation. Uh, on the top left, you have a, a simple step down forward, but also a lateral step down. Uh, the right side is more of an eccentrically lowering. So you'll stand up with both legs and slowly lower with one leg and then switch sides. And then the ever popular Bulgarian split squats, which I love to do. Um, most people hate to do them. They're very, very challenging. I love to add weight to these um, and add some core movements in with that as well. So it's, a, it's definitely challenging for, for dancers. But I, again, I think I have the utmost respect for 
for dancers because they are so strong. So sometimes they need some of these foundational exercises again too. Core is involved with all of these and I'm a stickler for form. And next slide. <clears throat> and then this is just more, again, posterior chain progressions for a bridge. So you can start on the top left with a double leg bridge, move to a single leg bridge on the top right, and then you can add some uh, unstable surfaces. So in this case of exercise ball on the bottom left, you're gonna be alternating uh, legs flexing through that while maintaining your core elevated with your glute squeeze. Um, and then on the, uh, the bottom right, you can either do a single leg bridge on the ball or actually do hamstring curls in and out with that, which is highly challenging to do that on one leg. So these are just some examples of, of some of the higher level activities that I tend to have my dancers do um, as part of their kind of cross training, non-dance specific um, exercises that they do. Um, I think that's it for the slides. And then one other thing, I did find a, a research study in 2020 that looked at a prevention program, which the star drill was part of that. Uh, their results actually showed an 82% decrease in injury rates of the experimental group. So the control group basically just can, continued to do what they were normally doing. Uh, but the experimental group, which had a uh, injury prevention program for around, I think, 12 weeks, they were doing it three days a week for at least 30 minutes at their own discretion, had an 82% lower injury rate. So I think that that's something to definitely keep in mind when it comes to um, watching and making sure that you're, you're putting yourself at least amount of risk when it comes to performing and the demands that the sport requires. All right, so if I'm understanding correctly, if we're dancers are doing these movements and cross training in this way, it can kind of, it can help to prevent getting any of these low back strains and injuries. Absolutely, the body's meant to be guessing, you know, it gets, um, humans tend to be wanting to hit the same routine and do the same thing. And the body gets really good at doing that stuff. But then when there's a variation or a disturbance in that normal routine, the body's unsure of how to react to it. So always keeping the body guessing about what's going to come next, I find is something critical that I like to really include in, in my uh, prevention programs. All right. Awesome. So kind of on that same topic, is there anything that dancers can do outside of dance um, in addition to cross training in that way? Um, to reduce and prevent low back pain? Yeah, so, you know, I mean, some things that come to mind, pay attention to signals from your body, not only during dance, but after, um, you know, are you having pain that um, is limiting day-to-day -day function that you're not sure is stemming from dance or day-to-day, -day, definitely worth investigating that and addressing it early makes sense. Promote recovery after all. I mean, you're doing all this training and you want the, you know, every time you're jumping, right, you know, you're breaking down a little bit of bone and changing the turnover of collagen in the tendons and you want to build that back up. So paying attention to sleep nutrition and hydration is probably, you know, going to serve you very, very well in not only preventing injury, but then, you know, being able to recover from injury. And we can, you know, certainly delve into some of those, those topics more, but um, in youth athletes and dancers, uh, it, it's clear that, you know, getting enough sleep is really challenging with training schedules and school and demands of all these other things. Um, but there have been several well done studies looking at um, athletes and dancers getting more way more than the, you know, seven to eight, sometimes less hours of sleep that, that people say they're getting. But, you know, if you're it, it is uh, shown to prevent injury, if you're getting into the nine, 10 hours of sleep a night, and that's hard to do. But those are those things are important and um, can really help in preventing injury and recovering from injury. All right. I think the other thing that Dr. Casey mentioned earlier, which um, I'm definitely more supportive of, are is the visualizations, guided imagery, things like that, where um, they visualize what they're going to be doing. Uh, I find that that better helps prepare the um, psychosocial piece of you know the biopsychosocial approach when we approach patients and injuries um, is is holistically treating the whole person and not just zoning in on just the low back. It's everything that is involved. So. I think those are um, something that I find is, is very beneficial, um, as well as you know nutrition and hydration. I think is definitely also the critical piece um, when it comes to uh, how they should perform and how they should definitely prep for what they're going to be going through. All right, perfect. 
Um, and we did get one question. If anybody else has questions, put them in now. Um, I think this is more for Jason. Uh, thoughts on axial loading exercises? Oh yeah, definitely. I am all for axial loading exercises. Um, axial loading for those who might not know and uh, Alexandra, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if this is not what you're thinking, uh, but basically anything that loads the spine. Um, in particular, I'm thinking, um, and I definitely utilize this barbell training, you know, throwing barbells on the shoulders, performing squats, deadlifts, uh, goblet squats with a kettlebell maybe. Uh, I, am, I am all for it. Uh, I find that it's definitely beneficial. Uh, it helps keep the spine uh, healthy. Um, I, again, I, I highly doubt most dancers are going to be squatting 300 pounds, but I think to load the bar up, absolutely. I think it's definitely beneficial um, in a multivariable approach when it comes to the 3D uh, dynamic stabilizers that the spine has to endure. Uh, it's not just you know forward and backwards. There's side bending, both sides, rotations, um, oblique angles. It's it's you know especially with dance, the body needs to move in all these intricate ways, and the stability for that is is critical. So I am all for axial loading exercises. If I can, I just add to that. I mean, I, I know the force is a little bit better in the gymnastics world, but you know, when landing and taking off from jump in dance, but similar in gymnastics, sometimes it's up to 15, 30 times, um, you know, an athlete or dancer's body weight that then their spine and all the other structures of the body need to absorb. So as Jason mentioned earlier, you need to get people trained and ready for the forces that they're going to, um, you know, be uh, encountered with in their sport or their performing arts. And so um, you do need to be to be using some type of loading, um, often resistance training that's not just body weight, to get people ready to absorb those forces because those are significant forces over time. Um, and so I, I'm happy to see that there's more acceptance of weight training and resistance training in the gymnastics and dance communities where maybe it hasn't been as widely accepted, um, but but using the knowledge that we know of the forces on the spine, for example, we need to have axial loading so that those structures are ready for that. All right, wonderful. Um, I don't see any other questions. So I think that's all for today. Um, thank you guys so much for speaking tonight. Um, we all really appreciate it and learned a lot. And thank you to everyone that joined tonight. Um,